maybe, maybe you'd like to do a little introduction of Frank for the few people that might not know. Frank Donovan is from Rhode Island. Now, he's a Yankee. <laughs> Devil would have guessed. He's not a Bright Sox fan. He's a Yankee fan. No, he's not. I'm kidding. I think I've known Franks ever since I, I was born. Um, he was licensed in 1959. He was previously KN1 LPL. Yeah. Right? And then K1 LPL. And then through some magic, he became W3 LPL. My first contact in the contest was with SIG. Oh, my God. Now we're really <laughs> <laughs> Not including the novice problem. <laughs> um, he lives in Maryland, as you well know. He has one of the premier multi-multi stations in the, in the world. In fact, they just did beat the K3LR machine. Complication smiled on us. Yes. It happens every so often. Um, Frank is a member of the, the uh, Contest Hall of Fame. He and I were both inducted in 1999. Yeah, yeah. Same, same time. Same time. Um, so he's been around a lot. He knows things. He's a really good guy to talk about antennas with, but he's not going to talk about antennas tonight. Well, I will a little bit. Oh, a little bit. Yes. It's part of the part, Just, of, the it's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. You, can't, you can't do a radio without antenna. But uh, he knows how to put a team together, and they do a really great job. So we have Frank Donovan, W3LPL. Thank you very much. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be back here again. John, I don't think it took me more than a few seconds to say that I would come. The, the last presentation I gave was kind of a heavy topic. It was receiving antennas. This topic is um, nobody's going to come away and copy anything that was done at NSS or anything else. And um, so there's no, there's no reason to, to take notes or anything like that. Uh, but if you do want to learn more about these topics, some of you might be interested. The best way actually to explore them is just maybe to write down the name of the topic and then just go on Google and you can find out all the truth and the lies about any of these topics. Chaz, uh, where I was sitting is a plastic envelope with some NSS 100th anniversary cards. Could you send that around the room? And anyone who would like to have one of those cards is very welcome to have it. We're not going to have another 100th anniversary, so they're just going to go in the trash. So you're welcome to take one. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started. Um, for about four years, uh, members of the PVRC have been putting NSS on the air on Armed Forces Day. And someone asked me, well, how did you ever get to do that? Well, we have two admirals in our radio club who are distinguished graduates of, uh, of the Naval Academy. So it turns out we can do almost anything we want at the Naval Academy as long as it's legal. So uh, one is a, four, a retired four-star admiral uh, in 4OC, and the other is a one everybody knows, uh, retired three-star uh, star admiral Scott K0DQ. Um, so this is the site, the way it looked kind of at the peak of its development, a 1,200-foot tower and, uh, and about, about a square mile of land, which it turns out for... Uh, the kind of communications they did here at during the heyday, which was uh, communicating with submarines, that antenna is nowhere near big enough, which led to the demise of the station. So let's go to the next slide. Who's going to do that? I can do it. Or, or you yeah. like. No, you can do it. Yeah, I'll just ask you to do it. So this is the QSL card, uh, if anybody wants to take that. Next slide. So just a brief march through the history of this station. But I'm going to go back in history a lot before that. So this focuses on... U.S. Naval Radio Station NSS. I'm sure those of us who grew up in radio in the 60s and the 70s heard that pounding signal on the, all through the uh, short wave bands, not in the hand bands, but not so far away. It was, it was quite, quite something to, to see. It, uh, my original uh, ham station in Maryland was about five miles uh, from NSS, and they, they were still very active on the air. So, uh, Going back to 1901, Marconi uh, was a businessman, but he was also very good at organizing. And that was one of the reasons that radio really took off was because of Marconi and not his engineering prowess, although he had some excellent engineers. It was because of his organizational prowess and his determination to succeed. 
Uh, the Navy paid attention to this. If, if, if they wound up not having communications, they were going to be in deep trouble. So they started coastal wireless operations in about 1903. And then they built their first high power station in 1913. And I'll show you a photograph of that. That continued operating until the beginning of uh, World War II, when it became very obsolete. I'll show you some of the very, very early receivers uh, going back uh, well before 1913. Um, World War I comes along and the Navy seized all of the radio stations in the United States, all of them, and the manufacturing capabilities of the Marconi Company. And they were never returned to the Marconi Company. Marconi owned most of the coastal stations and they were never returned. Some of them were uh, given to various uh, operators of coastal stations. And then a, uh, a company called the Radio Corporation of America was formed by the U.S. government. Um, and it took over the assets of Marconi and some of the other companies at the time. So the, the, the Annapolis High Power Radio Station started uh, right at the very closing months of World War II. So it never really had, of World War I. So it never really had a role in World War I. Uh, but if the war had lasted longer, it would have. Um, and I'll show you a photograph of uh, what was the key radio communication station in World War I. It was in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And a couple of the buildings from that station are still there in, uh, in New Brunswick. But the big antenna system and the big transmitter building have long gone. Uh, one of the key contributions of amateur radio to the growth of radio during that era was the 1921 transatlantic test. I have a whole different presentation on that. I'm not going to cover it in a great deal of detail, but it kind of changed everything. And uh, RCA and Marconi and others were very much involved with ham radio uh, during that period and very much uh, were affected by the successful results of that test. The heyday of radio communications, and especially HF, was in this period from 1922 uh, until the middle 1970s, before satellite communications really took off. And I'll show you quite a few photographs of some of the equipment that was used uh, by the military during that period. Uh, Also, during the period leading up to World War II, there was a great deal of investment in improving the capability of military uh, communication systems. And one of those things was to build a dedicated receiver station just outside the, what, what is now the uh, Capitol Beltway in Washington. This station is gone, but one of the towers from this station is now my 200-foot tower holding my 40-meter beam. And I can still hear da 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 Although that's not true because that was a receiving antenna. Um, the first satellite communication system, 1959. I'll show you a photograph of that. Now, how can that be? There were no satellites. Well, there was. It's called the moon. That was a satellite, and it was used for Navy communication starting in 1959, before the first satellite, for, before the first man-made satellite. Well, uh, yes, Sputnik was before that, but we didn't have any satellites. In the, the U.S. didn't have any uh, before uh, communications moon relay started. And I'll show you a photograph of, of a ship that was uh, outfitted with that, a pretty well-known ship. Uh, the massive NAA Cutler Main Station was built. Has anyone seen that station up there in the far northeast corner of Maine? It's unbelievable. The size, I've got a photo I'll show you of it, the size. It's just mind-boggling. It was built for the Polaris submarine program. It was part of the Polaris program. And then 1999, NSS went away. Next slide. So when did this all begin? Well, it began with this mathematical physicist, uh, James Clerk Maxwell. And he predicted uh, through mathematics the existence of electromagnetic waves as a part of his research in the 1860s. And uh, this particular book was published in 1861 as he began the work. But by 1864, he was absolutely certain that electromagnetic waves existed, but he wasn't interested in proving it. 
he, w- he was interested in mathematics. So when he was done with this work, uh, there was a prize that was offered, uh, but no one won the prize. The prize was offered to prove that these electromagnetic waves existed. It's called the Berlin Prize. Nobody even submitted. So the state of the art then was just these equations, the famous Maxwell equations for anyone who's an engineer who we had to study and suffer through those things in college. Okay, next slide. So then this guy came along a couple of years after the Berlin Prize was offered, so he wasn't eligible for it. And he built a, re- a receiver and a transmitter and communicated. And But he was also, his interest was proving that Maxwell's equations were correct. And once he proved that, he lost interest and moved on to other things. And you can see what he thought there. Uh, when I asked about applications for electromagnetic waves after he proved that they existed, he said, well, they're of no use whatsoever. It's just an experiment that proves that Maxwell was right. And that was what he set out to do when he proved he was right and he was done. Okay, next slide. So here's what, this is Hertz's lab. And this is how we proved it. This is a dipole with a spark gap in the middle, an apparatus to generate high voltages that could arc across this. And he had a couple of spheres at the end of that. That operated at about 50 megahertz. And this receiver, so this was spark technology. So spark gap here in the transmitter, about nine feet long. And this receiver was a metal ring with two, uh, with a spark gap at the end, very close. And with this very crude setup, it operated at about 50 megahertz. He was able to communicate about 20 feet. But it was electromagnetic. He could, he could rotate the, the polarization of the receiving antenna and the signal would go away. So he was clearly communicating. A little bit later, a little more sophisticated than this, uh, he moved the frequency up to about 450 megs, built a couple of uh, parabolic reflectors, and was able to increase his DX distance to 60 feet. But this was breakthrough. Okay, next slide. So then this guy comes along, Tesla. Now, his interest was not radio. His interest was power, wireless transmission of power. And what he was really interested in was high power and high frequencies. And by high frequencies, he meant not 50 hertz or 60 hertz, but maybe 10 kilohertz. So he invented the first high-frequency alternator in 1891, but not for radio. But it was very sophisticated. Uh, Next slide. And this is a model of that alternator, had uh, 384 magnetic poles. Is there any way to change the slide projector so we can see the bottom of this? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So the PDF cut. Okay. So anyway, um, the way the way they got these alternators to operate at high frequency is instead of having just a few poles, there were 384 poles on this. Uh, alternator and it operated at 3000 RPM. So, so, uh, and they could get about 10 kilowatts out of this. But for the receivers of the day, 10 kilowatts was nowhere near enough. Okay, next slide. So along comes Marconi. Now he's the first businessman to get involved in this. And that was really the breakthrough because everybody before this was a physicist or a scientist or they were interested in other things like uh, high power or, uh, or AC communications. Or, or AC power, um, lighting, arc lighting was a big thing in cities back in the 19th century, and that contributed to these technologies. So Marconi comes along, and he's a businessman, and he's also very good at organizing companies. So he hires some very good engineers and builds some manufacturing companies, and radio is on its way. Next slide. So this is a photograph of his, his uh, transmitter, that was used for the first transatlantic test. Now these were one-way tests, not two ways. Uh, two-way would come a little bit later. And this was a spark technology, very similar uh, to what was used in that very first transmitter. So th- now this photograph has been edited by somebody. Uh, if you look very closely at this photograph, you can see that this was added. So what was there originally, I have no idea. But this gets the, gets gives you the idea. It was a spark, uh, and then that connected out to the outdoor antenna, which I'll show you in a minute. It's about 10 kilowatts at 
500 kilohertz or kilocycles in those days, I guess. Okay, next slide. And this is what the transmitting antenna looked like. It replaced a much bigger antenna that blew down before Marconi uh, conducted this first test. So they put up a temporary antenna with uh, 50, 150 foot copper wires right on the ocean in Cornwall. And that was what was used for that first test. Has anybody ever been to Cornwall and seen any of the, real, the radio museums there? If you're ever in England, it's worth a trip to Cornwall. It was a place where a lot of radio was born and also uh, transatlantic uh, cables, both telegraph and telephone and uh, satellite communications also. So there's some fantastic museums there. Next slide. So why did they need so much power? Number one, the transmitters that they used were not capable of operating at very high frequencies. So, so they, uh, a really high frequency transmitter in those days operated at about 50 kilohertz. So the antennas were extremely inefficient and the receivers were unbelievably insensitive. So how did this receiver work? First of all, you had to have a mallet. Can you imagine operating a contest with a mallet? And the way this coherer worked, literally the term coherer means that this device in a vacuum had metal filings. And in the presence of an RF field, the, the metal filings would adhere to these two electrodes, which would allow an electrical signal to conduct across this. And these wires went to a sounder. So when you heard a dot and you had to pull out your, ma your magnet, go over here and hit this thing a few times until all the filings dropped out. And then you were ready for the next Morse element. So that's really slow. And this is what Morse, what Marconi used as his receiver in Newfoundland to receive that dot, dot, dot message that he allegedly received. He made a big, big mistake, and he learned from this. He had no witnesses. No witnesses. So he had to trust his word for it, and there's a lot of doubt as to whether this crude receiver actually did uh, receive that dit, dit, dit signal. Next slide. So this is what they use for receiving antenna. It's a fairly, this is a fairly famous photograph showing uh, Marconi and his crew uh, preparing the kite on Signal Hill. There's an excellent uh, museum here. Yes, it's very, very much. And a lot of these sites in Canada have uh, nice museums uh, associated with them. Next slide. And this is an illustration. And in this illustration, you can see the kite up at about 400 feet. So this is vertical right on the ocean. Uh, now, Marconi had to leave Newfoundland because when he claimed success here, there were transatlantic telegraph cables that also landed in Newfoundland. And Newfoundland, the Newfoundland government received revenue from those transatlantic submarine cables. They received no revenue from Marconi. And I guess the owners of those uh, transatlantic cables said, this guy's got to go. He's threatening our business. So that was the end. And this happened to Marconi many times in his career. His success caused serious setbacks, but he was determined that he always came back. Next slide. So he moved here. There's an excellent museum here also. But this was a failure. This is a photograph of his station with four 200 foot towers right on the ocean. And they re Marconi ran tests between Tablehead and his re engineered station, the one that I showed you uh, uh, with the, uh, tra with the uh, transmitter with the spark gap. He ran tests, they were all one way tests. So they transmitted in Cornwall, received here. It was not reliable enough for commercial communications. In other words, he couldn't compete with the transatlantic cables. So he had to abandon this after two years. Next slide. Okay, so let's uh, divert just for a minute. So at about the same time, this guy came along. So Alex Anderson uh, was an engineer at GE, 
And he did a lot of work before he got involved in high power transmitters with high power generators for AC power applications. And he was convinced and he was engaged to build very high power transmitting uh, uh, transmitters, hundreds of kilowatts. He started with spark transmit transmitters, but then quickly shifted over to take these uh, high frequency alternators that were developed in 1890 and apply them to uh, radio, um, which had not been done with those uh, generators that were built in the 1890s. Okay, next slide. So, uh, the very first two-way transatlantic radio communications were not done by Marconi. It was done uh, on Cape Cod, uh, between, Cape, between the station that was just a little bit north of Plymouth, Massachusetts, a place called Brant Rock, and there's a there's a IEEE memorial plaque there where the site was right on the ocean. And another station uh, on the southwest coast of, of Scotland. And this was done in uh, 1906. And this was uh, synchronous rotary spark. So just briefly, and I'm not going to get into a lot of detail because I've got about 80 more slides to go. If anybody wants to learn more about these technologies, just you know, write down those words and you can go to Google and you can learn as much as you can stand. But basically, the, what had happened here is uh, they started, uh, and you can see the poles of the, here on this wheel, and a, a 35 kVA motor. And uh, they realized that they could build, they could uh, transmit a cleaner signal with more power if they uh, put uh, many electrodes um, to replace a single electrode for a simple spark transmitter. So as the electrodes spun, an arc or a spark would be uh, ignited between one of the poles and the fixed pole, and then it would extinguish and the next one would start. Um, and this was kind of the technology of 1906. But Alex Anderson, he built this thing. He was working for GE at the time, and uh, but he didn't stop there. He went on to much better things. Okay, next slide. So this is the guy that invented CW communications. His name was Fessenden. But unfortunately, the technologies available to him uh, in the early 1900s were very immature. So although he, he actually invented CW communications, it wasn't very capable early on in his career. Let's go to the next slide. And this is a patent that he was granted in 1901. But unfortunately, there was no practical source yet for an oscillator. The closest thing there was to an oscillator at the time were these uh, rotary spark gaps. No one had yet thought seriously yet about taking these high frequency alternators from the 1890s. They were oscillators, mechanical oscillators, but they were oscillators. No one had yet thought to do that. So he had developed this and tested it crudely well enough to get a patent. His detectors were really crude. You couldn't go to Radio Shack and buy a 1N34. Uh, but they were starting to build detectors that uh, replaced the uh, coherers. But this was all very crude and impractical. And until vacuum tubes, or as then they were called audions, came along in 1906. This was just theoretical again. Next slide. So along comes DeForest, and he invented the what we, we would call a triode. At the time, it was called a three-electron audion. The audion was a two-element uh, vacuum tube, and it was widely used as a rectifier before 1906. Uh, and then the triode was developed. Let's take a look at at one of them. And there's the triode. Uh, those of you who are a little long in the tooth may remember what the schematic diagram for a triode looked like. Uh, back in those days, it wasn't a, a straight line with a few dashes. It was a, a jagged line, a grid. And here's why. The grid in this first triode, and in fact, it was named after the, 
a football grid. Um, that's where the term comes from, is from football. So, so this uh, tube was developed. Uh, 1906 was the first model of it. But uh, nobody knew what to do with it. So again, things kind of faded away. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. So uh, this slide's a little bit out of place here. So that's, that station uh, on Cape Cod that was used for that first two-way uh, communications, they ins Fessenden installed a 420-foot tower, and that's what was used. It's kind of like the guys on 160 now. They go to the coast of Maine. Well, he went to the Cape Cod Bay and installed this 420-foot tower right on the ocean. Okay, next slide. So, of course, Marconi's looking at this. He's a businessman. Unlike all these other people that we've talked about, he was a businessman. And his, uh, his objective was to compete with the transatlantic cable companies. The transatlantic submarine cable companies had a huge liability. And that is the cost of maintaining those cables was astronomical. When one of those failed, they had to go out and find it, they had to pull it up from the deep, splice it, and then successfully put it down. So you needed a whole a fleet of ships capable of doing this, very highly skilled people, and the cost was very, very high. Well, Marconi was very successful in 1907. Uh, this is a photograph, and I'll show you a photograph from inside. This is what was called the condenser house. Uh, and his antenna was uh, 200 feet high, 200 feet wide, and 1,000 foot long. But it turned out not to be big enough. Remember, receivers are still very, very insensitive. Uh, in 1909, no one had yet figured out how to use that triode vacuum tube for anything useful. So the, the uh, receivers were still probably not even advanced as a crystal anymore probably some kind of a wire and a chemical that was somewhat of a semiconductor and operated as a receiver, extremely insensitive. So the way you made this work was with many hundreds of kilowatts of transmitter power and antennas that were ultimately the successful ones were a mile long. So he built this station in Ireland. because this, The site that he had in, in Cornwall was nowhere near big enough. And then he was kicked out of Newfoundland, and the, the, the original station he built was much too small. It was a spectacular oceanfront location. There's a museum there, and it's absolutely spectacular, but it was nowhere near enough, big enough to put up an antenna that would work. So he put up this, he moved the four towers from table, table head, moved them to this site that was a little bit inland where he had a lot more land, and uh, from these four 200-foot towers, he extended the wires out to uh, 2,200 feet in diameter. And this station worked. This was a commercial success. Um, but then there was a fire at the Clifton Station in 1909, and they had learned a lot more and decided they needed even bigger. So they took advantage of the disaster of the fire to replace all the antennas with much bigger antennas. Next slide. And this is what transmitters looked like in 1907. This thing weighed about 40 tons, uh, produced 20 kilowatts. And uh, the Clifton transmitter was at 54 kilocycles and the Glace Bay at uh, 38 kilocycles. And this was 300, oh, it was a 300 kilowatt rotary spark, but the ERP was only about 20 watts because 20, 20 kilowatts because the antenna was only a mile long, it was much too small for these frequencies. So it's very low efficiency. Okay, next slide. And this is what the inside of that condenser house looked like. It was uh, 1,820 metal plates, each 30 feet by 12 feet. And this was a 1.8 microfarad capacitor operating at 18 kilovolts. Now these sites, both of them were so remote that you just didn't connect up to the power line. You had to generate your own power also. So uh, these, these uh, sites had not only transmitting, uh, gigantic transmitting equipment, but also had their own power generation. Next slide. Here's a, here's a map of the Clifton Ireland site at its peak of development. So this was a much larger antenna that was installed after the 1909 fire in Canada. So that it was 2,500 feet long, 
800 feet wide, uh, just a couple of miles from the ocean. So this was the condenser house right here, power plant over here. Um, and uh, this, this was all powered by peat. So he built his own peat mine with a railroad that connected the peat uh, mining operation uh, to the power plant. So this was all self-sufficient. Next slide. So along comes Armstrong and he figures out what to do with this three element Odeon. And his first breakthrough was the regenerative receiver. And I'll show you a photograph of that. And then he does the super heterodyne a little bit later. Next slide. So here's his Armstrong's patent for the regenerative receiver. And this literally signaled the onset of electronics. Uh, the first practical use of the Odeon and the end of what is sometimes referred to as the Jurassic radio era. You can appreciate why Jurassic radio is a descriptive term because everything was enormous in order to be able to communicate with such low frequencies, inefficient antennas and extremely insensitive receivers. And there's a diagram of his uh, patent that was patented in 1914. Simple regenerative receiver. Okay, next slide. Single sideband. Look at the date on this patent, 1915. Well, single sideband didn't really become a factor in radio communications for about another 35 or 40 years, but the patent is really, really old. Uh, those of you who are engineers would re should recognize that's a balanced modulator. And uh, I think because the frequencies were so low, the way they did the single sideband thing was just, the antenna was efficient for one sideband and extremely inefficient for the other. So uh, probably a more honest way to describe this, although it was described as single sideband, is probably suppressed sideband because there was no real filtering. Okay, next slide. So along comes Stanford Hooper. When he was eight years old, his father gave him a, a kit to build a very crude radio. And he kind of started the way a lot of him started. It's very, very young. That's how he got started uh, in his career in the Navy and ultimately became the director of Naval Communications. And he is always referred to as the far, father of US Naval Radio. Next slide. So the first high power station that the Navy built was in Arlington, Virginia, directly across from the uh, Arlington Cemetery on a very small piece of land, only about 13 acres. These buildings still exist. They're uh, still used by the Navy for administrative function, but they are still there and they still look exactly like they do in this photograph. But the towers are long gone. When National Airport was built, uh, these had to come down. So in 1941, when National Airport was built, these towers were removed. But this site was much too small uh, to be used for anything serious. So it was, it was, it was time. But there were uh, three uh, 450 to 600 foot towers with flat top antennas. You can barely see them in this in this photograph. Okay, next slide. And this is a photograph of the, trans of the first transmitter that was installed at NAA in Arlington. It was a 100 kilowatt synchronous rotary spark. So the technology is still spark. The very same uh, technology uh, that was uh, used in the very first radio transmitter at 50 megahertz back in, 19 in 1864, still spark. It's the rotary spark. So there's um, many more uh, points of the spark and the uh, motor that drove the spark by this time was synchronous. So it was uh, the uh, period of rotation was very, very carefully controlled. So it was very stable. Next slide. Okay, so along comes World War I and the Navy seizes all of the radio stations in the United States. And one of the stations they seized was in New Brunswick, New Jersey. This building is long gone. But this was uh, Marconi's most advanced uh, tr transmitter for transatlantic communications. Wow. Uh, it was it had just reached completion as the war began. The Navy took it over and upgraded it. So let's go to the next slide. And this is what they did. By this time, Alexanderson at GE had 
has shifted his focus away from Spark, the big synchronous Spark transmitters, and shifted over to building very high power alternators. And this alternator that was installed at NFF in New Brunswick weighed 100 tons. There were two alternators, so there are two transmitters, one alternator here, one alternator there driven by motors. One of these still exists and is still on the air. It's uh, SAQ, and it will be on the air on Christmas Eve. It's in Sweden. It's the only surviving one that still operates. Okay, next slide. And this was the antenna that was at New Brunswick. It's, this is still very much Jurassic radio. Uh, 600 feet wide, 5,000 feet long, 400 feet high. There used to be a Kmart in New Brunswick where this antenna was located and ran along the side of the river that goes through the middle of New Brunswick. But the antenna is long gone. Okay, next slide. So, a ham has a role in all of this. So the Navy is using this Marconi site that they had taken over, NFF in New Brunswick, but they can't hear the signals from Europe reliably. They started in Washington, they could barely hear them there. And they used some of the Marconi receiving stations that they had received from him and they discovered New Jersey was a little bit better than Washington. And there was one on Cape Cod and that was a little bit better. But then this ham in uh, Bar Harbor, Maine contacted the Navy said, you know, I can tell that you're having a hard time copying this stuff and I'm copying everything. Absolutely rock solid. And the Navy went up to investigate, and sure enough, his ham station was able to copy all these messages that the Navy could barely copy at all. So he worked a deal. He said, I'm going to give you my station, but I want to be commissioned as a Navy officer. And that threw a monkey wax in the whole works. It took a long time, months, for the Navy to figure out that this was a good deal to get a functioning radio receiving site, far better than anything they owned, for free if they would only give him a commission in the Navy, but they did. And it became by far the most successful World War I transatlantic receiver site. Okay, next slide. And this, uh, this is the antennas that we use today. This was the antenna. So, so when the Navy moved in, they built some serious buildings here. Um, and this is uh, one, of, one of the loop receiving antennas, one of many. And you can't probably see it from your distance there, but there are many wires. There are insulators here, insulators here. Uh, and then this is the width of the loop. But this is, this is operating at really low frequencies, like uh, 30 or 40 kilohertz. This is very much the same type of loop receiving antenna we use in our ham stuff today. Okay, next slide. Okay, so then this organization called PVRC comes along. But anyway, PVRC was formed in 1947, and uh, Leo Young, W3WV, was an engineer in the Navy uh, shortly after, well, actually just before World War I. He was responsible for a lot of the uh, uh, Navy receiving capabilities during World War I, and he, he went on after the war uh, to, to become an engineer in the development of uh, the Navy's uh, radio and radar equipment. Next slide. And this is uh, probably the first receiver that was ever generated in mass. So before this receiver was developed in 1918, uh, from what I've read, what was said was, if you've seen one Navy receiver, you've seen one. They were all different. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to run a military if every weapon you own is different than every other one. So, uh, at the time, the organization that did this was called U.S. Navy Steam Engineering. That's where engineering got done. There's no such thing as electronics engineering as a professional field in 1918. Um, so the work took place there, and they built thousands of these regenerative receivers. And they operated in the frequency range that was popular uh, during that time. This was before the hams got involved with uh, the transatlantic test, so it was down in, in the low frequency range. Next slide. Well, World War One. 
the U.S. Navy was very, very concerned. Their primary means of communicating with Europe was by submarine telegraph cables. And they knew that the Germans had outfitted some of their submarines with equipment capable of cutting cables. So the Navy had a crash program to get uh, a large transmitting uh, station installed in the United States, and this is where NSS came from. And they actually had plans to build an even bigger one in North Carolina with 600 foot towers that were to be made of brick. But that station was never built because the war came to an end and I guess everybody thought peace broke out and everybody uh, relaxed for a while. Well, the prediction of, of uh, having cables cut was real. 28th of May, 1918, this German submarine U-151 uh, cut two cables off the coast of Long Island. But they got the wrong cables, thank God. So the cables they cut, uh, one connected uh, the US to South America and one was a relatively local cable. They missed the transatlantic cables and never did cut them. And even these local cables, they're relatively important. They were six weeks later, they were running again and uh, the Germans never did cut any other cables. But I'll tell you, this is a serious concern even to this day. You can be sure that Russia knows exactly where all of our transatlantic cables are today. And if there's ever a serious war, those cables won't function after the first few days of a war. Okay, next slide. So the headquarters of naval communications at the end of the, end of the war was located on uh, the Navy Annex on the mall in Washington, DC. This building has long since been taken down and this is near what is now very close to what is now the World War II Memorial. And you can see the receiving antennas in this photograph right here. But if you can imagine uh, two towers, one here, one there, these are flagpoles. Uh, but if you can imagine trying to receive signals in the middle of a city, this probably didn't work really well. Okay, next slide. So uh, NSX is being constructed. It finally goes into operation about two months before the end of the war. And they never really did much of anything important from a war perspective other than some tests to prove the station was ready for use. But you know, they apparently didn't pay attention enough to what Marconi was doing because the Navy started building these antennas that were too small and they didn't work very well. So this first station in, in, in Annapolis was uh, only an 800 by 800 foot footprint, 600 feet high. Uh, the transmitter ran a lot of power, but the ERP was only 10 kilowatts and it was not a very reliable transmitting station for transatlantic use. But the only thing that saved it is by then uh, the regenerative receivers were available, so receivers were a lot more sensitive than, than they were back in the in the uh, period well before World War One, when there were no uh, electronic receivers. Next slide. So Polson comes along, and invented the uh, arc transmitter in 1903. And let's go to the next slide. And this, th these were the transmitters that were installed at NSS. These weighed about 20 tons a piece. And uh, the way this technology worked, and if you want to learn the details of it, you can go on Google and just Google Polson Arc, and you can learn as much as you want and see many photographs. But the heart of the Arc, and there's a pair of transmitters here, one here and one here. The heart of the arc transmitter was in this cavity. It was two electrodes, one carbon and one copper. The two electrodes were in hydrogen. I think that might have been a little bit dangerous, <laughs> but it was very, very well sealed. I've never heard of an accident that occurred with this, but don't try this at home. Uh, very, very well sealed. The purpose of the hydrogen was to provide some of the cooling, but the copper electrode had to be water cold. So the copper electrode was hollow, water went through it. And the carbon electrode was slowly rotated so that it didn't burn in just one location. 
And in order to be able to increase the power, these are, these are magnets right here. So this 500, 500 kilowatt transmitter, this is one 500 kilowatt transmitter, that's another one. Polson discovered that if he put the arc, so the arc was fired by DC, uh, that he could increase the power on the arc very substantially if he put the arc in a powerful magnetic field. And what the magnetic field did, did is it pulled the arc off to the side, so it effectively increased the size of the gap. Gap had to be small enough to fire it off, but then in the magnetic field, it would become the arc would become a bow rather than a straight line. And that allowed him to generate 500 kilowatts of RF in 1918, and it was a near CW quality signal. Next slide. Navy continued to use these until about 1932. So Armstrong comes along in 1918, and this is his next famous patent, 1919, the super heterodyne. So if, if you remember early from 1901, there was this patent for a heterodyne receiver. And the heterodyne receiver couldn't be built with practical components. But by 1919, vacuum tubes were readily available, and Armstrong actually built this receiver called a super heterodyne, very much based upon the principles from 1901, from Fessenden's uh, patented 1901 heterodyne receiver. And very soon, super het receivers obsoleted all prior receiver technology, and we still use them today. Or K3 receivers or uh, super het design. Okay, next slide. So uh, this is a next generation regenerative receiver. Uh, again, thousands of these were built uh, in the 1920s. And you can see photographs of naval radio stations all the way through World War II still using these receivers. Next slide. So, 1921, perhaps one of the most important breakthroughs that hams have ever made. Uh, by 1921, hams were successfully communicating between the East Coast of the United States and the West Coast. But they couldn't find any knowledgeable enough hams in Europe to duplicate the same tests across the Atlantic. So they said, okay, the ARRL got involved, uh, sent one of their, uh, one of their people uh, to Scotland and built this station. And I'll show you some more detailed photographs of this, but there's a pair of receivers here and he's in a tent. Now, ARRL learned from Marconi's mistake with the S and uh, and uh, they were able to get Marconi to volunteer one of their inspectors to witness everything that was done in this tent so that there would be no question as to whether the signals received at about one, one megahertz was the approximate frequency where these uh, uh, tests took place, that they would absolutely be a witness to everything that took place. And this fellow Pearson was there every night. Uh, and when they talk about high frequencies back in those days, they're talking about one megahertz. Okay, next slide. So this was the super hit receiver that Armstrong uh, built and they took to Scotland. This is the tuner section here in a, in a separate box. And that's how they bought receivers in those days. The tuner was separate. You can see the wires connect again. This is the receiver side over here, a nine tube super hit receiver. Next slide. Okay, so a group of engineers from RCA, you know, these big companies are getting involved. They really, really, really want this test to succeed. So some of their engineers got together and built a big station in Connecticut using high power vacuum tubes. 250 watts was high power vacuum tube in those days. Before 1921, all, all of the uh, vacuum tubes were receiving tubes. The technology advanced enough by 1921 that these engineers could get these tubes from RCA and they built themselves a one kilowatt uh, transmitter, CW transmitter. Next slide. There's a photograph of it in Connecticut. And you can see three of these 250 watt tubes used in the amplifier section. And a fourth tube was used as the oscillator. Is it really? Well, he probably, he, I'm sure he learned from it. Yep. Yeah, can you imagine uh, this? 
there's a, there's a chair right there. Can you imagine sitting in that chair? Okay, next slide. Uh, so the Navy is learning from all this. So these are the four original towers that were put up in 1918. So they expanded this antenna to be 2,500 feet long. They added two more towers here. This, by the way, is the field where we operate our NSS ham radio activities in the modern era. And our little tiny masts with K3 transceivers were far, far more effective than any of this stuff from 1922. Okay, next slide. Well, crystal control transmitters come along. 1924, PVRC member, but PVRC didn't exist yet. Leo Young built this transmitter, 10 kilowatt transmitter. Uh, one was built for the Army and it was installed at NSS Annapolis. Very successful uh, and, and it led to generations of, of subsequent transmitters, each, each improving on the next, on the previous. Okay, next slide. Well, uh, radios are starting to get installed on uh, airplanes as well as uh, dirigibles. And this, this uh, radio receiver was rescued from the wreck of the USS Shenandoah. Um, very serious accident, not as famous as, uh, as the one in New Jersey, as, as the accident in New Jersey, but many people died. But the, uh, this receiver survived. You can see some of the things that are broken on this dial. And this came off the wreckage of the Shenandoah. And this receiver from 1924 covered all the way up to 17 megahertz. So things were, things were developing fast now that we're um, in the post-1921 transatlantic test and well into the development of higher and higher performance uh, receivers and transmitters. Next slide. And 1931 comes along, and AT&T patents this directive antenna called a rhombic. And countless thousands of these things were built. Massive antenna farms. Next slide. Uh, this transmitter repla finally replaced the Pulse and Arc 500 kilowatt transmitter in Annapolis in 1932. So up until 1932, they were still using that 500 kilowatt pulse and arc. And this, this transmitter had 50 10 kilowatt vacuum tubes. I don't know how long it is, but it's pretty substantial. Okay, next slide. And this is uh, the kind of uh, transmitter that the Navy used during the 1930s. 50 kilowatt HF transmitter. It weighed 16,000 pounds, eight feet tall, 20 feet wide. Uh, and the stations that use these typically use rhombic antennas and they produce more than 100 kilowatts ERP on HF. So these were now very serious, very serious uh, capabilities. Next slide. So receivers are coming along. So this is uh, 1932 technology. It's a super head band switched receiver, probably one of the very first band switched receivers and the first Navy 115 volt powered receiver. 1932, it weighed 450 pounds. Not your K3, but I'm sure it was a fantastic receiver. Next slide. And this is a photograph of that main Navy building on uh, what is on now very close to the World War II Memorial. And you can see some of these receivers that were newly installed in 1932. Okay, uh, and uh, this is a, not a very clear photograph, but these are typewriters. So an operating position was a fairly simple desk with a typewriter and receiver right in front. <laughs> yeah, what's a typewriter? That's right. Look it up on Google. Next slide. So. An interesting thing happens in Maine. So if you remember this ham station, 1AJ, turned out to be the Navy's only really effective receiving station in World War I. Well, if you've ever been up in Maine, there's now this beautiful national park. And that park was developed uh, by uh, 
so, sorry? The by the Rockefellers, yes, by the Rockefellers. But there was a problem. Right in the middle of this park, right in one of his most beautiful waterfront locations was this dilapidated old Navy receiving site. Uh, and the Rockefeller wanted that out of his park. So he made a deal with the Navy. And again, the Navy had a hard time saying yes. He said, I'm going to build you a brand new receiving site, 15 miles to the north, right on the ocean. And all you got to do is give me your old broken down station in the park that I'm building. And it took the Navy a long time to say yes, but they finally did. And <laughs> you'll never see another Navy station with all the buildings were built in this uh, classic stone style. And a lot of these buildings are still there. It's a couple of them are, are part of a museum. But that uh, station ultimately closed in uh, 2002. Next slide. So this was the kind of the peak of development of NSS, 1938. By then, they had built the antenna they should have built in the beginning, 800 feet wide, 5,000 feet long, just kind of like what Marconi built in 1909. Took the Navy a little longer. But this is the, this is the VLF antenna that they used uh, up until the early 1960s. And they used uh, 500 kilowatt CW and fax transmitters. This, this antenna produced about 130 kilowatts ERP and was well capable of communicating with submerged submarines. Next slide. Well, so we talked about rhombic antennas. This was the first receiver station specifically built for transoceanic radio communications. This was a receive site only. It was in Manahawken, New Jersey. And you could see how many rhombics were in this site. So look at all these diamonds, dozens and dozens of them. The poles are still there? Yeah. yeah. One square mile. And that was the typical size of an HF receiver site uh, from the 30s through the 50s, about one square mile. Okay. So, oh, the Navy learned from this. Uh, they installed dozens of rhombic antennas also at uh, the NSS transmitter site. Okay, next slide. So, well, we have to suffer with FT-8. Back in World War II, they had to suffer with RIDI. And by 1944, a lot of the CW circuits got displaced by this thing called radio teletype. They built 200,000 of these Model 15 teletype machines, enough that you could still find them occasionally at, at uh, ham fests or certainly museums. Oh, okay, next slide. So this is a photograph of the received site. So the Navy uh, decided to build a site uh, well away from the city in a place called Cheltenham, Maryland. And this is where, where one of my 200 foot towers came from. Uh, right now, it's just a, couple, a mile or two from the Beltway and it would be a terrible location. So uh, this photograph is from 1950 and there's still some of those old 1930s era receivers in use here. And there's a Morse operator over here and a radio teletype operator over there. Okay, next slide. Well, there was a problem with superhead receivers. And that is they, the, the oscillators were fairly high power with the technology they had uh, up to and including World War II. So in the VLF range, they did not allow super HEP receivers to be used on Navy ships. No. So they were forced to use what are called tuned radio frequency receivers. So there is no, no uh, IF. All of the processing of the signal took place at the radio frequency of the signal you were receiving. So all of those tuned circuits had to track uh, the signal you were receiving. So this was kind of the peak of the development of uh, VLF uh, receivers uh, in the Navy. Okay, next slide. And you can still find some of the re these receivers. Uh, PBRC member W3EIS, very well-known top bander. He was W3IN and N4IN uh, back in the 70s and 80s. He was one of the design engineers. This receiver was designed by the US Navy 
and it was manufactured for the Navy by RCA. It was a bin switch super heterodyne receiver. I'm sure it was a superb receiver. I've never used it, but uh, I'm sure it was excellent. So this, this uh, started production in 1940. Next slide. Okay, so in order to make uh, radio teletype communication even more reliable, they decided that they would like to use diversity. So this was the state of the art of, diverse, of diversity receivers. This was built by RCA for the US Navy in 1940. There were three receivers, receiver one in that rack, receiver two in that rack, receiver three in that rack. Four racks weighed 1,700 pounds. Now, can you imagine operating this receiver? This is just an exploded view of the controls on one of the receivers. So that was the, these are the controls for the first RF stage, the antenna coupling, the second RF stage, the third RF stage, the mixer, there's the band switch over there, and the oscillator frequency on this little crank dial, and the RF gain control over here, and the vernier dial to control that. Now, can you imagine QS wiring around the band with this receiver in a contest? But I'm sure this was a fantastic diversity receiver. And uh, at least one of these was installed at NSS Cheltenham or space diversity. And, uh, and for ships at sea, the way they handled diversity in order to get uh, the reliability of diversity is they use frequency diversity. So they would transmit more than, they would transmit the NSS HF signal on more than one frequency. And then you could receive that on a single antenna on board a ship and use a smaller version of this receiver for diversity combining. Next slide. Okay, so some of you have probably heard that there was a telephone circuit that ran from Washington DC to London that allowed Roosevelt uh, to communicate uh, with uh, Churchill in London. And this equipment was built for that circuit. Uh, this is, was the Navy's first uh, single side bin that ISB HF receiver built in 1943. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And this was the Navy's first single side band, an ISB exciter, two kilowatts built in 1943, primarily for the uh, transatlantic secure voice circuit to Churchill. Independent side band. And so the two, so instead of having a single side band, each of the side bands could contain different information. Uh, that's a whole different story. Believe it or not, uh, the, I've, I've seen the, some of the equipment used in that device in the National Cryptologic Museum at Fort Meade, Maryland. And it was a very, very stable turntable that you might use for a record. And that record contained one time key. So there were records of, probably nobody in this room's old enough to remember what a record is. <laughs> but that's how the key was, was created on those records and played on a, a very stable turntable. And there was an identical turntable at the other end of the link. So you had to start it at the same time. That's how, that's how the technology worked. And it worked. That's what they had at the time and they made it work. Okay, next slide. So uh, continuing the, the development, there was a well-known company in the United States called, called Tress and Wireless, it was a commercial company. They built high power transmitters and they, built, they also built copies of them for the Navy. This is a 15 kilowatt transmitter from 1943. Next slide. And here's a 40 kilowatt version of it. This was used in the uh, Roosevelt to Churchill uh, transatlantic telephone circuit. And this was built by Preston Wireless. It was called the PW40. Next slide. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. But uh, it, was, it was an operational system and they used it to communicate routinely, but how often, I do not know. Uh, you can probably use your friend Google to help you find the answer. So this is a photograph of the, uh, of the transmitter that was used on the Roosevelt to Churchill circuit, the SSB ISB exciter driving a 30 kilowatt amplifier, 1943. Next slide. Okay, well, the end is coming. And this is one of the real clues. 
that maybe HF is doomed. 1945, Arthur Clarke writes this article uh, in Wireless World about this radical concept called communication satellites. And kind of like the beginning of radio, it took a while for this to become real, but we all know that it did. Yeah, science fiction at that time, right? Exactly. Yeah, but it was a detailed forecast and it was right. Okay, next slide. Okay, so time goes on and uh, now Federal Telephone and Telegraph Company and Collins are manufacturing high power transmitters. Notice this digital stuff is sneaking in 400 words per minute FSK. Is anything like that happening in our world today? Okay, next slide. And here's, uh, low, this is a low frequency transmitter. So this is operating at about 100 kilohertz more or less. A new 800 foot tower was installed in Annapolis. So this, this was used kind of for, I guess you'd call it ship to shore. Uh, d distances of maybe a thousand miles or two thousand miles. Okay, next slide. And uh, digital stuff. So now they're really starting to get rid of the CW operators and they develop this stuff called 12 channel voice frequency telegraphy. So what they're able to do with this is to multiplex 12 teletype circuits onto a single single sideband transmitter. So with an ISB transmitter, you could stack two of these together with 24 channels. And if you tuned the HF bands in the 50s and 60s and their early 70s, you found these all over the place. Okay, next slide. Well, especially if you were on a ship, it was hard to have enough antennas. So they started developing multiplexers. And this is a photograph of a 10 kilowatt transmitting antenna multiplexer that would allow uh, three transmitters on a ship to share a single antenna. It had to be separated in frequency by at least about 10%, but this was built in small quantities by the Naval Research Laboratory. Next slide. And then this technology comes along and this dooms the rhombics. Is it, by, that, by now it's easy to produce lots of power. So you don't need the standard one square mile site anymore. You just need a, a few dozen acres and some 50, 60, 70 foot towers and these Collins log periodics. And you can get rid of these one square mile and bigger sites. And there were countless thousands of these built, some of them still in use. Okay, next slide. And then, uh, comes the conical monopole, which is a broadband vertical. And the benefit of this is that the, uh, the Navy runs lots of broadcasts and they want to cover the omnidirectional. So this is the first broadband omnidirectional antenna from 1963. So it allows even more antennas to be gotten rid of and just run a high power transmitter into this thing or more than one to a multiplexer. And thousands of these were built. Next slide. And this is kind of the end, the beginning of the end. A company called Technical Material Corporation was formed on Long Island to compete uh, with some of the other companies I've mentioned earlier to build high power equipment for the US Navy. And this was the kind of the premier transmitter that was built by TMC. Unfortunately, the business people at TMC weren't as good as the engineers. And they never successfully competed for next generation transmitters after this one. Uh, Harris Corporation wound up being the premier company after this. Okay, next slide. And this is what a diversity receiver looked like in 1960, a mere two racks. Probably, yeah, maybe, a, maybe a little less than a thousand pounds, but this was the technology of 1960. Okay, next slide. And uh, now, so now, now the transmitters are getting to be automatically tuned. Uh, 1970, Technical Material Corporation is just about out of business. And about the only thing they're doing is maintaining their equipment. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yep. It was spin-offs, though. It wasn't built specifically. One, probably the best known one was the GPR-90 receiver. That was, that was built for their military customers. And, of course, they, like a lot of these companies, 
the engineers who designed this were hams. Um, and one of the engineers is still is a still a PPRC member of K3WX, and he was an engineer in the heyday uh, of TMC. So the Navy has switched over to automatic two transmitters now. Uh, the TMC transmitters were no automatically tuned, and TMC lost this competition, and they uh, never won another major competition after this. Next slide. Okay, so here's another nail in the coffin of HF. Anybody know what the USS Liberty is? So that was the ship that was uh, nearly sunk by the Israelis. Um, and on this ship was this relay terminal. And it was used for satellite communications, but not with a man-made satellite, with a natural satellite, the moon. You'll have to use Google to get that answer. <laughs> I do, I do not know, but I'm. But they still do it today. These, there are still these kind of. Yeah. So you still find, but they're not communicating through the moon anymore. Okay, so so that's the first military satellite communication system. The uh, transmitter was in Annapolis uh, at the NSS transmitter site, and the receiver was at NSS Cheltenham. And they had uh, terminals in Hawaii and Okinawa and England and also on six Navy ships, one of which was this famous USS Liberty. But can you imagine communicating? You know, you, the, the, the captain of the ship wants to communicate with, with Washington, and you say, well, we can't do it yet because the moon's not up. So it was a kind of a limitation back in those days. Okay, next slide. So this big station was built as a part of the Polaris submarine program. Two ginormous antennas. Uh, the center tower, 1,000 feet tall. Uh, each antenna had 12 ring towers, anywhere from 800, almost 900 feet high. These antennas could be operated together or independently. Uh, so this is a very reliable uh, design, still there today and still being used. Uh, two megawatts ERP at 20 kilohertz. Why still 20 kilohertz? This is used for submarine communications. Next slide. That antenna was the end of NSS. So they tried building a bigger antenna at NSS. Here's one of these big towers similar to the one in Maine. But... The poor guys in the mid-Atlantic couldn't compete with the station in Maine. Similar problem to today. Yeah. Uh, and the reason, among other things, is that even though this is a beautiful location, it's a peninsula that extends out into Chesapeake Bay, that peninsula is nowhere big enough. Uh, that antenna was only 3,000 feet in diameter. There was only room for one of them. So it only produce 400 kilowatts of ERP as opposed to two megawatts of ERP from the station in Maine. So ultimately, uh, this station was dismantled. Next slide. So the receive site at Cheltenham was moved and they moved it to West Virginia. And there was a Navy base in West Virginia that supported this system. And they commonly referred to themselves as the West Virginia Navy or the Mountain Navy. So these were two electronically steerable arrays, about uh, 450 feet in diameter. And if you fly across that part of Virginia, West Virginia on a commercial aircraft, you can still see the scar on the ground left behind from these antennas. No, they were long, long since gone. And these, are lo these uh, were located in the National Radio Quiet Zone. Okay, next slide. Well, this was really the nail in the coffin right here. 600 Navy ships were equipped with 25 kilohertz bandwidth UHF channels that communicated through the Marisat channel, uh, communication satellite. The Navy leased 22 UHF channels on each of three satellites in 1976. Big success. Next slide. And this is what happened. That's what happened to NSS. 
So NSS HF mission was terminated shortly after that contract was awarded for the Marisat communications. There's no need for HF anymore. So they thought the VLF transmitter stayed in operation until 1999. And uh, after the VLF transmitter was shut down, this happened. Well, they well just let them fall, but they it was a little there was a little bit of help there, you know. Yeah, but they didn't no, they dropped them. Okay, next slide. Well, they they left three of the towers there. They're still there today. Uh, there was a lot of pressure from people that sailed the Chesapeake Bay that they used these for uh, for navigation, and also that they were historic. So these towers are still here today. Uh, we do not use those for our NSS operations. And the reason is that the, the firing range on the US Naval Academy shoots directly towards these towers. And although they don't intentionally hit those towers, they're directly in line. So whenever the firing range on the Naval Academy is active, this area is closed. So inevitably, if we tried to operate NSS from these, we'd probably find out that it was closed that day and we couldn't get to the site. So we operate from a different place. Next slide. And uh, this is what our NSS operations look like. Um, AB-577 mast, it's commonly called a rocket launcher. That's a 20 meter dive hole on the top. Two US Navy tents, K-3 transceivers. Uh, a little uh, three kilowatt generator, far more effective than anything the Navy had at NSS until the well into the 1920s. No, we can't talk to subs. But the Navy couldn't talk to subs either until the late 1930s. Okay, next slide. And there's what our operations look like. I think that's a, that's not a K3, that's another, I don't know what that is. It's a FT-847, I think that is what it is. Okay, next slide. And this is the, the, the uh, Director of Naval Intelligence stopped by, she was once a ham. And she made a 40 meter single side band QSO. Next slide. So this is a photograph of the original 1918 station, the original transmitter building from 1918. And we operate from this little field right here. Really, really nice operating location. Next slide. And in 2018, we made 900 QSOs. We're pretty proud of that. Next slide. And then we discovered that this guy back in 1965 had done the same thing. So this is Scott Red right here, K0DQ. And uh, let's go to the next slide. He did pretty well. He got this certificate of merit from the Chief of Naval Communications, they made 2,894 QSOs. <laughs> okay, next slide. And there's some of the operators at one of our towers. Next slide. This is the last slide if anybody's looking for a job. Get a job sending fees. That's, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. That's his son. But he just long, long, long ago, a silent key. Oh, yeah, long ago. Uh, W3WV passed away early 1980s, I think, and his son died 10 years later. Any other questions? Okay, hope you enjoyed it. Oh, okay. yes. So during all the development of the radio, Marconi and then all the days, has anybody ever gone back and done a correlation with the sunspot cycles and whether or not, I know it was low frequency, but did that hamper or help their development at all? Or? I'm sure it did. I don't know what to do to, or to what degree, but I think the main thing that hampered development was the lack of technology. There was no lack of good ideas. The good ideas go all the way back to 1864. Uh, it wasn't until Marconi came along 35 years later that some real business 
acumen and drive to make commercial success entered this scientific field of radio. And then of course, then the military realized that they couldn't be left behind. So the force of the military came along and that really drove things. And then of course, 1922, uh, commercial radio came along, AM radio broadcasting. Sometimes people ask me when I got involved in radio and I have a consistent answer. I will always answer the question, when did I get involved in radio the same way, 1922? It's true, absolutely true. People will say, come on, be pretty serious. When did you get, 1922? Well, here's why. I lived in a three family home uh, owned by my grandparents. And when AM radio exploded in 1922, my grandfather got interested in it and he was building one tube radios. He was building for neighbors also. The commercial radios were extremely expensive and he could build these relatively inexpensively. Well, once his family came along and then the depression came along, he put all that stuff aside in the attic of his house. And I was raised in that house. So when I was about eight years old, he put all this stuff out, 1922. Everything he knew about radio, all the equipment that he had from radio was 1922. The only thing that wasn't was the batteries we bought. So I built one tube radios with him when I was eight years old. So 1922 is when I began. Okay. No, a lot of people are saying thank you for the presentation. Good. What was 1AJ's secret sauce at that station? I mean, what did he do that the Navy didn't that made him so much more effective? Okay. What's going on now in Maine? Yeah. Now. Is it just location? That's it. That's it. So there's all these big ham stations being built in Maine? Yeah. That was the same thing here. Geography. Geography, right. But, uh, but to be a little more serious about it, at these low frequencies that were being used for transatlantic communications in those days, uh, thunderstorm, thunder crashes were a big problem. Has anybody ever tried to operate on the new ham bands, uh, 600 meters and was it 1200 meters? The noise is unbelievable. Well, as you go further north, that thunderstorm noise declines dramatically. So not only are they closer to Europe, but also the noise level drops precipitously. And uh, the first transatlantic telephone circuit was built in 1927. The receiver site was right on the Canadian border, right where Interstate 95 now crosses into Canada. As far north in the United States as you could build it. And that's where they put it. So K1LZ and, and W2RE are just copying what people did in the 20s or in World War I. They learned the lesson. Okay. Right. Thanks very much. You're very uh, welcome. Before you go sit down, we uh, Steve has something for you. Great talk, Frank. Is that a three dash one thousand? <laughs> no, not eighty eight seventy seven. Even better. It's even better. This is a commemorative of our ninetieth anniversary. Oh, very nice. Twenty seventeen. Very so nice. I expect you to sign your logs. Get, and get, get, oh, yeah. Sorry. Get in the picture. Get back okay. up. And. And this is our uh, coffee cup for this year. Very nice. Where we readily beat everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on your victory over LR. Yeah, that was sweet. Yeah. <laughs>